Kia ora everyone and welcome to our new edition of Cobblestones Chronicles. I'm delighted to be in the studio today because we're on level two and I'm actually allowed to be in here, which is great. It was lovely talking to Michael over the Zoom call, but not quite the same as being in the studio. It's really good. And isn't it good that, you know, we're getting there with this virus despite a few more cases but um somehow somehow we're managing to get there with it so it's good on us the team of five million we're doing a great job um despite the occasional lapse now uh, this morning um i wanted to talk a little bit about our hospital in cobblestones because um, Cobblestones is, as you know, a collection of some of the oldest buildings in the Wairarapa. So we have the first hospital that was built in in the Wairarapa, in Cobblestones. And I'll tell you a bit about how that came about and a bit about um, how it was, how it was built and why it was built and when it was built. But before I do that, I thought I'd play a piece of music because I want to acknowledge the people who have continued to work through lockdown, often under difficult circumstances. So Michael Wilson, the station manager, was here all through lockdown and he did a grand job of, you know, keeping the radio programmes going, interviewing us via Zoom, doing all the technical stuff. And, you know, I'm sure he was pretty lonely here because usually there's lots of us coming backwards and forwards. And here he was all on his own. So he did a great job. But there's also a lot of other people. There's all our medical staff. There's all the people who've been jabbing us on the arm. And I'm delighted to say that I've had my two vaccinations now because it's obviously that's one of the ways that we can combat this virus is by getting inoculated, getting the vaccine. And so there's been all those people and they've been doing a grand job because I actually had my second um, vaccination during the lockdown and went into the Featherstone Clinic and they were very efficient and very effective and got us through, got us sorted out and back out of there as quickly as possible. It was really great to see and well separated. And then there's been all our horticultural and our farmers because they've kept going through lockdown because they don't actually have a choice so there's lots of lambs have been born because this is lambing season I know because I was popping a lamb that had managed to get through our fence um, into the wrong paddock this morning. I was popping it back over the fence to its mum and we've got quite a few lambs and a a few more to come Uh, there's all the calves and there's everything else that goes on on the farm. And just because we're in lockdown, that doesn't stop. So I want to really acknowledge all the people who are keeping on going to make sure that we have food to eat and that all our animals are looked after because I'm really clear that most farmers really look after their animals really well. And of course, cobblestones is a lot of cobblestones is about farming because cobblestones was set up by the Small Farms Association in the 1800s, mid 1800s. And that's how cobblestones came about was to celebrate how come our early settlers worked so well and set up all these farms because they started off with 40 acres farm and um, one acre in town and cobblestones is celebrating the trials and tribulations that they went through and our idea is to give everybody just a little glimpse of what it might have been like and 
Um, fortunately, we had uh, the Small Farms Association mostly had a good uh, relationship with our local iwi. And um, I'm delighted to say that we are having you know, a nice relationship with, with um, our local marae. And it's good to see them, you know, um, coming and doing over the midwinter Christmas. We had some, uh, a group from uh, Papawai come in and do some toy poi workshops, which was great. I just watched, love watching people making poi and learning how to use them. And then they did a fantastic presentation about the origins of Matariki. And we had about 60 people in our little church for that presentation. And everybody came out raving about how fantastic it was. So that's what we're all about at Cobblestones. So as I said, I want to celebrate the people who are working so hard to keep everything going, no matter what level we're in. So I want to play a song. And this song is um, called The Rainbird in the Tree Tree. And it's by a a well-known New Zealand songwriter called Peter Cape. And it's all about um, the drover. It's about a you know, somebody who's been out in the hills working the stock or doing whatever he has to do and he's coming home. So here it is, The Rainbird in the Tea Tree, written by Peter Cope and sung by Mike Harding. So here we go, you'll hear it in just a moment. Out of your window and you'll see me 
I'll be coming in off the track Look out of your window and you'll see me I'll be coming in off the track Well, that was Peter Cape uh, song, The Rainbird in the Tea Tree. And my apologies for the little blip where you might have heard some odd music coming in. It's because I hadn't, I thought I'd switched on the CD. I hadn't switched on the um, player on the desk. So totally my fault. Sorry about that. I haven't been here for five weeks, which is, of course, why you forget sometimes what you're supposed to do, although it's actually relatively easy. So um, I said I would talk about Wairarapa's first public hospital today, and Greytown Hospital was contemplated by Governor Gray when he was negotiating with the Tangata Whenua, so when he was um, buying one. 150,000 acres. Um, the going rate at that time in 1853 uh, was, seven, was under seven pounds an acre, but the condition was that 5% of the funds raised would be set aside for schools, medical services and flour mills for Maori. Um, the medical services bit, however, was delayed until some 20 years after it had been settled, when the resident magistrate and the Wairarapa sheriff, H.S. Wardell, drew the attention of the administration that public houses, in other words pubs, were not equipped to act as hospitals and the best resources um, would be served by building a hospital. And in fact, the Impetus to build the hospital came from Greytown residents themselves, who in 1873 called a public meeting to discuss the proposal for the hospital. Greytown Trust Lands Trust supported the idea and offered a 1.3 acre site in the town belt. And the Greytown Standard newspaper editor gave the promoters a hurry up in April 1874 urging them not to let the project lose steam. And within 10 days, the committee had renewed its efforts to raise funds. So finally, in early February 1873, three trustees and a management committee were appointed. And on 26 February, the hospital plans were approved. And in fact, it was planned by, it was designed by um, Richard Wakelin, the editor of The Standard. Obviously, people multitasked a lot in those days. So it was built in July 1875 at a cost of £325. It was called a cottage hospital because it was quite small. It had two wards, a doctor's room, a two-room dwelling for the couple in charge, a storeroom and a scullery. However, it didn't have a bathroom, so I don't know how they managed. Um, and a newspaper article of the day noted it would be an improvement to the present building and no doubt the hospital committee will, according to the means at their disposal, improve for this want as early as possible. So the way I understand it, eventually there was a, a bathroom or at least a, a somewhere to have a bath put on um, eventually. So the hospital opened just in time because 1875 was the peak of the typhoid epidemic in New Zealand with 323 deaths that year. And considering how small our population would have been in 1875, that would have been a lot of people. So obviously our current epidemic or pandemic is not the first one we've gone through in New Zealand. 
At least five people with typhoid were cared for at Great Anne Hospital. During that time, it became known as the Fever Hospital. And I think if you go around to New Zealand, you'll find quite a few fever hospitals because there was typhoid. Um, as a little hospital grew, the Victoria Ward later became known as the Winman's Ward. It was added in 1889. A windmill was also erected and two 400-gallon iron trunks um, supplied water for the hospital for kitchen, bathing, washing, firefighting and for the fruit and vegetable garden because they had a garden at the back. Um, The garden was an important resource not only to feed patients and staff, but also birds. It was resolved that the chairman draw the attention of Matron to the item bird seed in the accounts, which should not be charged against hospital supplies, according to the hospital committee's minutes at one time. Unfortunately, the hospital's days were numbered. After 30 years of operation, plans were made to rebuild it over a two-year period. The Minister of Health condemned the old building in 1910 before it was moved to the southern end of the grounds, renovated slightly and used for storage. That move enabled the establishment of a new hospital. And the Great Anne community recognised the needs of its disabled, aged and incurable residents, as did Member of Parliament Sir Walter Buchanan. With Sir Walter's insight, determination and a generous donation, the 20-bed home for incurables was built. With a nurse's home, an operating theatre and a larger ward named the Buchanan Ward. That opened on the 18th of July 1912 with much fanfare, herded by the local Caledonian band and toasted by staff and distinguished guests in good Scots whisky. Well, they obviously had the right idea because my grandmother used to tell me that good whisky will cure almost anything. I'm not sure she was absolutely right, but um, I can remember sleeping quite well when I had a cold because she used to give me a whiskey toddy with a tiny amount of whiskey in it, lots of honey, a good squeeze of lemon juice and hot water, and I certainly did sleep well whenever I had one of those. Um, But it's also, of course, the people who were involved in the hospital. And as I said earlier, the medical staff who are keeping on going at the moment are doing such a wonderful job. And it was the same then. We had Dr. William Bay, who was the medical superintendent from 1881 until 1918. He was Scottish, of course. He was renowned for the introduction of a five-shilling coupon scheme. That allowed the purchaser free medical treatment for a year. He was often heard advising his patients in the Scottish lilt. If all else fails, take a wee drop of castor oil. After that, we had um, Dr. T.A. Roberts, who practised after 1930, who reminisced on making house calls. He says, I recall trips to Cape Palace and Lighthouse in the immediate post-war years when all the rivers had to be forded. So you still have to go out, um, you still have to ford at least one river, I think. Last time I went out to Cape Palliser, I had to ford one river. But there's um, many rivers to get out there. Some of the rivers appear to be pretty treacherous, Dr. Roberts said. But fortunately, I had a Ford V8, and in this I would proceed as fast as possible and reach the other side. The last three miles or so had to be done on horseback, um, and one, on one occasion, I made it clear on the phone that I was no horseman and we would need a placid horse. The dear old thing I was given jogged along so slowly that even in the end, even I had to spur it on. Um, 
There's some interesting documents in the Centennial Booklet, um, Hospital Centenary Greytown, published in 1975. And there's um, a quote when one new patient was admitted, nurses were faced with a problem before bathing him. As his singlets came dirty, he had steadily added a new one on top. After number seven was removed, the patient had a reluctant bath. After a stay of several weeks in hospital, the patient was discharged. He had, of course, been regularly washed and bathed during this period. Six months later, the patient was readmitted in a very dirty state. He said, of course, he hadn't bathed since his last admission. He had been washed too much while he was at Great Anne Hospital already. Um, there's a great town farmer, Barry Kempton, who is obviously descended from um, settlers and um, his first set, um, ancestors came here in 1854. So the Kemptons have been here for a long time. And he said, um, he said, my first experience with the hospital was having my tonsils out in about... 1952 when I was six. In those days you used to have the old chloroform cloth put over your mouth which was pretty horrible. I can't imagine what it would have been like having your tonsils out with chloroform over your mouth. It must, it must have been really terrifying. After all, having an operation when you're as small as six is difficult enough. Um, this other interesting person who was at the hospital was the last of the swagman, um, Russian Jack, who you might have heard about. And we have a book about Russian Jack that we sell in the shop for children. He died in the hospital's Buchanan ward with frostbitten feet in September 1968. And his memory lives on. He was officially known as Barrett Crewman, but he everybody knew him as a hard-working and good-natured gentleman of the road. And one of my friends who used to farm out at Piranoa, and his family have farmed out at Piranoa for a long time, he says that he can remember Russian Jack coming to the back door and his grandmother would always have some jobs for him, um, often doing things like, you know, odd jobs, uh, bashing out any or repairing any pots and pans that had, um, that had you know, got um, in need of repair. Uh, and he would, um, little bits of fencing, things around the house. And he would always um, have a huge appetite. So he would be given lots of scones, um, a good meal, and a, a place to sleep for the night or two while he was doing the job. There's a, a statue of him complete with the large swag bag and it was it's in Masterton and it was unveiled in December 1999 and as I said um, he, he um, had been in New Zealand for a long time. He wasn't actually Russian he was a Latvian and he left the sea and took to the roads of the North Island of New Zealand. In an interview in, when he was in Great Anne Hospital, gave the answer, Man, oh man, I was free. Free to have a beer, free to have a smoke, happy what you can call all the time you know. They was free days. So... That's the story of Great Anne Hospital. Every object has a story in cobblestones and we're working on how to tell all our stories. So we have a new virtual guide in the church. Please, when you come along to cobblestones, try it out. We've got free Wi-Fi and you download an app and then you watch your virtual guide come alive. It's, um, it's a great way to get just a wee glimpse of what life was like for our early settlers. And now, we were talking about whiskey before, and what I thought I might do is play you a track called 
Old Men and Whiskey. Now, um, this track... I'm just queuing it up now. Um, this track, um, this was written by a friend of mine, Alan Downs, who um, came off a farm on up in the Hawke's Bay um, high country, Hawke's Bay hill country, and um, he has wonderful fond memories of listening to people uh, talk about what you did when you grew up. So you got to smoke and drink whiskey. And I think this um, track tells the story of of when he grew up. When my old man drank whiskey, we thought that's what old men do. Well, he smoked a pipe, and there were times he'd have a beer or two. We were young and growing, and we were told from early on. Smoking and hard liquor was a game for old men. By the time we tried a cigarette, now that didn't go too well. Turned up late for dinner, short of breath and green as hell. Well, if cigarettes and smoking gonna do that to you. I'll take a rain check on the whiskey till I'm an old man too. Cigarettes and whiskey I never did back then Smoking and hard liquor was a game for old men And I guess if I live long enough I'll get to be one too Old men nowadays way older Than the old man I once knew Well you get to be 21 You think you're growing up Your old man's still way ahead of anywhere you just got Then you slip on by 35, you think you're getting on You're about the age your father was when you were just born But you're still not half the age, some blokes that you know If you're gonna be an old man you got a long way to go Cigarettes and whiskey I never did back then Smoking and hard liquor was a game for old men And I guess if I live long enough I'll get to be one too Old men nowadays way older Than the old man I once knew there was a time we all thought you get to be an old man Easy as going past a line in the sand But old men always older I never do seem to catch up And if I ever do get across the line I hope the whiskey's worth the wait Cigarettes and whiskey I never did back then Smoking and hard liquor was a game for old men And I guess if I live long enough I'll get to be one too Old men nowadays way older Than the old man I once knew They say whiskey and good living Improves with age Enhances a character Develops good taste But one thing about smoking The old man always said It's better to be smoking In this world than the next Cigarettes and whiskey I never did back then Smoking and hard liquor was a game for old men 
And I guess if I live long enough I'll get to be one too Old men nowadays way older Than the old man I once knew That was Alan Downs with Whiskey and Old Men. Um, that's it for Cobblestone's Chronicles for this week. I'll be back with you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the programme today. Bye. <laughs>